Jumbly Plant Orgasm may have was the most influential band of the early 80s neo-rock emperor revolutionary genre. To really understand the effect they had on the modern rock era, you have to go behind the awesome. Jumbly Plant Orgasm Mayhap got their start in the suburban Illinois garage of DJ Schmidt. At this time, the band had just two members and was called Drop the Soap. One, two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> Kevin have been lifelong friends, growing up in identical brownstone houses in the suburbs of Chicago. Their journey began with the birth of DJ into a family of western coyotes in the late 1880s. It was a crazy time. time on the Great Plains, but I swiftly and firmly established myself as a power player in the Midwestern bracket of funk. Of course, though, at the time, funk was simply a word for holding part of a frog apple. Ah, uh, there were the good old days. Sure, his only instrument was the ribcage of a deer strewn with sinew, but damn, did he rock out! The era progressed, and by the time the 1980s rolled around, DJ's own brand of prairie funk had died out and DJ had grown up. He then decided it was time for a great change in his life, and eagerly made his way to the suburbs of Chicago where, little did he know, his future was awaiting him with a hula hoop and one short-ass skirt. No! Yes! Enough! I'm Dude, going to bed! Don't... DJ had trouble fitting in at this new locale and soon fell into the bad crowd. Intermittently, his nights were spent with his beloved cardboard box or reciting entire episodes of Hanging with Mr. Cooper. These hobbies developed into habits and before he knew it, Don Falegio, as he was affectionately known, found himself in jail after attempting to force the kidnapped Mr. Cooper to act in one of the 12 three-hour long megadramas he had created based on the hit show. According to DJ, that's the point where I entered this story. You know, despite the fact we were lifelong friends, we lived next to each other in identical brownstone houses for all, all our lives. And um, we even were roommates for a time when I had to move in with him because he forced me to pay for his college tuition. But either way, that day when I went to pick him up from jail, he, uh, he pretended like he'd never seen me before. He started screaming things like, I was just there to get another crack whore for my army and I don't know, he seemed oddly eager enough to go with me even though that crack were I but that's besides the point. Anyway, I bailed him out from jail and then we fled the country and returned as our secret identities of the upper and lower half of Mr. T. We decided we needed a way to make money and DJ's new brilliant plan was to somehow make money by creating small controlled fires throughout the city. We tried that for a couple of months, but it didn't seem to work. And I don't know, I guess that's when I finally wised up and told DJ we needed a more concrete business plan. This brought about the prodigal creation of Jumpily Proto Band, Drop the Soap. Either talented, good looking, or possessing the sense of smell, the first step of the evolutionary chain of J-Palm emerged from God's womb like a mutated test tube baby from Bolivia. Crack-headed and horrible it was. Up next, find out if Drop the Soap makes it big or drops the figurative bar of dial. They went all over the city trying to sell their music. But no record company anywhere would take them. Drop the Soap was the olive in the martini glass of the music industry. But this olive wasn't soaking up any martini. You may have been along by Luke Kevin. Uh, when he was bad. 
I was in a band too, you know. Yeah. Well, it wasn't really a band, more like a gang. But we did roll bums and bang on their heads like it was condos or something. <laughs> yeah, little Kevin did it. Boys had this dream being in a rock band. Problem was they weren't any good. In fact, I mean they sucked. That's why we used to make them play in the garage. And then when they weren't looking, we up and moved. I gotta get to the father's report. Hey! You gotta get to work or what? Shut up, woman! <laughs> yeah, ain't no man can ever let a woman. Times were hard as they had ever been for dropping soap, and soon they were faced with a tough decision. Yeah, so for some reason, Kevin changed it to the Bamiya necessary to pawn DJ instead of for the band's instruments. And what ended up happening was that Kevin wandered the streets remembering his friend. The future of Kevy, and much less his musical career, was looking grim. That was until he met one special little boy. He statements that And he has no history, for he is the Lizard King and can do anything. <sighs> and that No, I did not just steal it from the doors. And that Well, okay, actually I did. But, but I invented the doors. I had patented them a long time ago. And I, uh, I mailed them in an envelope to myself. We could tell from his birth certificate that Andy was born April 6, 1903 in the beautiful city of Portland, which is located in the province of Tyler is Stupid. Andy grew up in troubled times and scenes such as the following were a common occurrence in the nation's everyday lives. Hey, these are troubled times, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. But hey, wanna go to the Gap? Sure, but it's behind me. So, just rotate. But, but, is it okay? I... I don't know! Is it? It pained Andy to live in a world so undecided about rotation. So he decided to rise up to the challenge. Working his way up the political system, Andy became the first senator first person to publicly declare rotation to be okay. On this day, I officially declare rotation to be okay. However, despite his already large following, in these warring times taking a distinct stance on rotation was not an easy one. Late spring of 1964, Andy finally had his chance to really change things. He received his party's nomination to run for president against Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson. The two attempted to join together and wipe Andy out of the election, but Andy was not without his own fearsome tenacity. And to Barry Goldwater I say, A-U-H-2, you suck! Unfortunately, these times were a-changing. As Bob Dylan said in one of his songs, everybody's got a Palm Pilot. And it was true. The age of the Palm Pilot dawned, and Andy, unwilling to change with the times, was removed from the election. Cast aside by the same rotating society he had helped to create over a box that would help you plan your day, Andy sank deeper and deeper into depression, out of society, and some say, out of his mind. Barry Goldwater? Well, well piss on him hard! And think! Don't drink any water! However, a few days later, at a casual box social for those who lie in the gutter, there was a meeting that would change the futures of Andy, Kevin, and the shape of rock and roll as we know it. Luckily for us, the cameras were rolling. I don't want you. Take this glove. Yeah. No, it's me, Kevin. Kevin? And Kevin! Ah! See, the thing about rock music is if Andy and Kevin hadn't met at that box social, 
All rock would consist of would be a bunch of Schweinhunde sitting around talking about how they're